morning and welcome to worship to everybody. Uh, we're going to have a couple of baptisms today, Lorena and Natalie. Uh, we're going to celebrate Holy Communion. Everybody's welcome for Holy Communion. It's not my supper. It's not your supper, sir. It's the Lord's Supper. So it's available for everybody. And if you don't want to come forward, uh, you can stay in the pew and we'll bring it to you. How's that? Is that a good deal? <laughs> okay. I'm Jeff Swanson, uh, old DLCA pastor, retired a couple times, military chaplain. And uh, I mean, if I could be real blunt and frank, I wish I wasn't here uh, at this spot this Sunday. I wish I was sitting back there with my, my family. But Pastor Jerry uh, would be here, but he is uh, recovering at home from a heart attack. And so that's why uh, Pastor Jerry Lamb is not here today. But he is the pastor here. And I'm just sitting in. I'm going to help out the Rocky Mountain Synod with some congregations in El Paso pretty quick. So I'm a member here with my wife Donna and our daughter. And uh, so we, we come in and out. But if you don't know me, here I am. <laughs> okay, what announcements we've, have we got today? What announcements? Church council tomorrow night, I think, right at uh, 6 o'clock, Jim? And is it right? 5.30, okay, let me make sure I get the time right, 5.30, and we're going to do that by Zoom, right? Okay. All righty, are we good to go? The service of light. May the light of Christ rising in glory dispel the darkness of our hearts and minds. The light of Christ. Thanks be to God. The light of Christ. We pray to you, Lord, in whose honor this candle burns, that you will continue to vanquish the darkness of the world and faithfully shed light on all of the human race. Amen. Okay, I'm going to read the Easter proclamation, and this is one of the Sundays that the pastor gets to kind of shift some gears here. I'm going to read uh, the gospel, not from Luke, but from, uh, we're going to read it from uh, St. John. And this is the story from St. John, the 20th chapter, about uh, the first Easter. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple and the one Jesus loved and said, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but on the, the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who reached the tomb first, who also went inside, he saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. And I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. 
Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Then Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, she said. And she told them that she had said, that he had said these things to her. It's the gospel of the Lord. Amen. He is risen. He is risen. Dear Christian friends, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, you our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, somehow a big stone got rolled away and some people peered into an empty tomb to grapple with the message. Like them, we have come to Easter Sunday services. Help us be enlightened by your love in Christ Jesus, not only this day, but for eternity. Amen. Amen. Okay. So what happened? Well, in that uh, first Sunday and in the first Easter, uh, some women went to the tomb. They had their reasons to go there. Uh, the Gospels tell us they had spices. They were looking uh, to anoint Jesus' body. And, you know, we all have our reasons for coming here today, too. And I'm a retired military chaplain. It's my duty to, you know, call when preached and uh, preach when called or however you want to say it. It's your personal perspective that brings you here. Maybe you're a long-term Christian, and this is what you do every year on Easter Sunday. 
Uh, maybe you're curious. Maybe you're here with the family for the baptism. You know, we all have our reasons for being here this Sunday. And uh, like them, like those first women that got to the tomb, um, we behold a great mystery. Like, wow, what really happened? What really happened? And I don't think we're going to sort it all out today in our hearts and minds, but we can begin to grapple in a new way. So let's talk about that big stone being rolled away. Um, I read the lesson from John's Gospel. Uh, John's Gospel is eloquent Greek, ancient Greek. They didn't have as many words back then as we do. So one word in their language had to mean often many different concepts depending on how it was used. A stone is a stone, is a rock to them and to us. But to them it could also be something you trip over, something that gets in your way, a stumbling block. And the tomb, now that word is really interesting in the Greek. It's the same word that we get our word for memory. Now think about the practical implications in those people 2,000 years ago. You know, maybe there was Bubba, okay? And Bubba was a goat herder. He herded goats up and down the streets and out in the mountains and to the streams. And old Bubba, you know, he worked hard. He was an adobe mixer. He could mix up adobe plaster out of the mud and get it just right and smear it on the houses and keep the houses warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And old Bubba, you know, he was strong. He could pick up a jar of water and carry that into the village from the well for his family. And old Bubba was a good family man, maybe a father or husband or whatever. Maybe Bubba was pretty good with his hands. He could do some carpentry skills, frame in a door. And all of a sudden, one day, Bubba died. Now, all of those activities that Bubba did, all of that energy that was going on from his life and community was over. And Bubba became a memory. Think about it. Bubba became a memory. That was the big danger on that first Easter Sunday. That the first Christian disciples would get all mixed up and befuddled by stumbling blocks and big stones and big things in the way of them understanding the message of Jesus, which was to proclaim God's love for them, not only this day in their lives, but for forever or relegate him to simply being an ancient philosopher, some kind of a smart old guru whom we would remember. That was the big danger. When I was a little kid, I remember going to Sunday school. And we had a little book. And the book had like a little artist drawing in there. Uh, we could color it in with uh, color crayons and little paints. But it was like a, like a hill with a hole in it, a round hole. And then there was a big round rock set off to the side. We had to color it all in. And I did that as a little kid. Oh, I must have been maybe six years old. I wondered, how in the world did that great big rock get rolled out of the way? And I don't know. I still don't know. Do you? But whatever caused those people to get out of their stumbling block mode and miss the fact that Jesus was resurrected from the dead gave way. And Jesus was not stuck in that tomb. How do we know? I'll tell you how I know. I'm looking at you. We're not simply dealing with the inspiration of some ancient hero or some ancient philosopher but a living Lord that intervenes in our lives to this moment and day and somehow tugs at our hearts and our minds and says, get up and get going to church on Easter Sunday. <laughs> it 
Come and think about these things. Bring your fears, your hopes, your doubts, everything, and lay it at the altar of Jesus. In history, that stone has been rolled away. Uh, I have a lot of favorite people from history. And sometimes they even get on the radio and present as them. Gouverneur Morris, who wrote the preamble to our Constitution, is one of my favorites. Benjamin Rush, Revolutionary War doctor, Surgeon General, um, recognized as uh, a founder of uh, modern psychiatry, one of the heroes of the 1793 um, epidemic in Philadelphia, yellow fever. Went to church three times every Sunday. He went to the AME church, he went to the Episcopal church, and he went to the Baptist church <laughs> there in Philadelphia. But you know what? All of these people, they're gone. They're gone from this life, but not Jesus. Jesus is still with us, not just simply inspiring us by a memory, but is in us. And so that stone was rolled away and is rolled away. Now let's take a look at uh, peering into that tomb. The Gospels uh, make a great emphasis on what the women did. And I'll demonstrate. Now if you walk in here and you look around and you see the altar and you see the baptismal items set up and you see the beautiful flowers, you see the organs over there and the pulpits over there, you got it. You see that picture, right? Well, what happened with the women? They really took a good, hard look. What is this? What's going on here? Why is this here? What's happening? And that's what that word means, where they, they stooped over and they peered into the empty tomb. I think that's the business of the church, is to help us take our questions, the insights that we have, and we take a good, hard look at this story. And we can ask, could it be true? Is it true? I don't think there's any way that we can empirically convince somebody that this is true, that Jesus rose from the dead. Because, first of all, none of us were there. We didn't have cameras there. When we send our astronauts up into space, we put sensors on them so that we can you know, monitor their heartbeats and their respiration and temperature and all that, but we didn't have any of that there. We're talking about a story that's 2,000 years old. So we have to enter in as we look at this story with a, a, a mystic sense. But that's just as real as the empirical data and even more real. There's only one reason that those women really went there. They went there with spices to anoint the dead body and to look for Jesus' body and all that, yes. But there's only one existential reason. They were in grief. They loved Jesus. And there is only one reason that we grieve as humans, and that is that we love. I saw a debate many years ago, it was between some anthropologists, they were scientists, and it was back in the 70s before we have all the uh, DNA tests and so forth, and they were talking about radon, radon uh, carbon dating of some old bones that they had found in a cave. And one, there was two anthropologists, and one of the guys kept referring to the bone chips as humans, and they were trying to figure out how old these things were. And one guy kept saying they were human, and the other guy said, well look, they may be human or they may not be human, but we really don't know. We don't have evidence to indicate that these were human bones. They might have been from some kind of other animal. And the first scientist said, oh, I am absolutely convinced they are human. I am totally convinced they're human. 
And the other guy said, well, where's your evidence? We're scientists, you don't have evidence. Why are you so convinced they're human if you don't have evidence? And the fellow that was convinced said, I I'm not convinced because of uh, the bones. I'm convinced of what was with them. Layer upon layer upon layer of flower petals. Some human, he said, went back there, maybe an individual or a group, and put flower petals on that grave every year and put multiple layers, and that's what the anthropologists found. What that indicates is the power of love. Somebody loved that person. My guess is that we all know grief from some loved one that died. Right? Hurts, doesn't it? God loves us. Loves us so much that God became one of us in the person of Jesus. And even went through death for us. The women had love for their Lord in their hearts when they went to that grave. The Lord had love for those women and for all of us when the Lord came out of that grave. I think also the church needs to, you know, I'm talking about all of Christendom, not just this church or whatever, but we need to start engaging uh, in a, a, a deeper dialogue to use the tools that we have, the insights that we have from philosophy and science to start you know, critiquing the story and, and, and looking at it, we may get some amazing insights. For example, just play with math for a moment. Is there a biggest number? Is there a smallest number? No. There's only continuums of numbers. And guess where we're at? 17th of April, 2022. Yesterday was the 16th, and if we live till tomorrow, it'll be the 18th. We're on that continuum, and God has put us there. What happens if we stop, if we drop, and we die? We get some insights into God's love for us in the scriptures, even even the hairs of your heads are numbered. That's how well the Lord knows you. Sir, you got some miles on you like me. But before you were in your mother's womb, the Lord knew you. That's how much you're loved. Another number. We put this in the Bible when we had scholars arrange the verses. I think it was an inspiring thing to do. When Jesus encountered his dead friend Lazarus and raised Lazarus from the dead, the shortest verse is there, two words. Jesus wept. God just plain loves us. And we're included in this grand process of creation. And even though we stop in this mortal dimension, doesn't mean that we stop forever. What defines life? Well, certainly one of the ingredients for us human beings is our brain that God gave us. Wow, this is powerful. We use it, not be dense like that stone in front of the grave. What did Einstein say? Smart guy, physicist, mathematician, he said, knowledge is important, but imagination is even more important. Imagine God's great love for us that doesn't let us go, even in our moments of death. God has us and is holding on to us and is not going to let us go. That's another verse. No one is going to snatch them out of my hand. And so we can use the insights of math and science. We can talk to 
If you really want to have an interesting conversation sometime, talk to a psychiatrist, talk to a psychologist, talk to a neurologist, and ask them, what, what is this business of consciousness that we have, this self-awareness that we are alive? Is it just simply a bunch of electrical impulses? Go to Simon and Garfunkel's song. All we are is dust in the wind. Think about that for a moment. The dust of creation God used to create the first people. And they were not alive until God's breath. In the ancient Hebrew, the word ruach was breathed in them. Then they became alive. And then think of this, that we are so beloved by God that God is not going to allow anything to claim us from his love, not even death. And so a power that God has that we don't have, God uses on Easter Sunday to give us hope. So we've got a message to grapple with. If the church can help you with that, by Bible studies, by welcoming your kids into the church, by baptisms, by forgiveness of sins, by Holy Communion, by getting you all together, us all together, so that we can proclaim the great hymns of the church and the creeds, and we can use all of that energy, that spiritual energy that came out of that tomb and launched Christianity into history and now resides in us. And I say, go for it. In some way, grapple with that message. And I think three things will happen. First of all, we're going to encounter the love and the hope of Christ in a very big and powerful way in the way we live in this life. And then something's going to happen deep inside of us. It may be really tiny, but we're going to look into the darkness of death and nothingness, and we're going to see a little bit of light. And what's that light going to be looking back at us? I think it's going to be the light of Christ's countenance. Saying, I love you. I'm not even letting death have you. You're mine. I got you in my hands, and I'm not letting go. I love you. That's Easter. Amen. Okay.
Okay there, let's uh, bring the young ones forward, front and center with all the sponsors. And let's get uh, our council president, Jim Hoydahl, up here. And, and uh, where, where is uh, Barg? It's gonna have the, the uh, oh, look at that. What do you got there? Two quilts, is that precious or what? <laughs> come on up here, come on. <laughs> We're gonna celebrate holy baptism. And, and if you don't want to come up, you can stay there, but, you know, I just invite all the family and loved ones forward if you want. It's up to you. Yeah, you come on up here, too. Yeah. Get you all up here. Have a little congregation. Come on. Get a little closer. <laughs> Wiggle in here. <laughs> okay. So, Lorena and Natalie. You're Lorena? No, you're Lorena. Okay, you're Natalie. A little taller than you. You look so much alike, and you're just so full of bright-eyed love and so happy today. Okay, page 227 in our, uh, our, our, our uh, Cranberry Lutheran book. And I'll guide you through this. So this is going to be painless, okay? And you're, you're going to get wet, sir. <laughs> God, who is rich in mercy and love, gives us a new birth into a living hope through the sacrament of baptism, by water and the word, God delivers us from death and sin and raises up to us to new life in Jesus Christ. We are reunited with all the baptized in one body of Christ, anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit and joined in God's mission for the life of the world. Okay, who is presented for holy baptism, Mommy? Tell me their names. Uh, why did you name them Natalie and Lorena? Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're a little Natalie there. <laughs> okay, Nat, Nat, Natalie and Lorena, you are called by the Holy Spirit and you are trusted by God, to live out a life of your baptism. And so I'm going to ask us all here some questions. Um, this is for the, the and you probably don't have the, the bulletin in front of you, but the congregation does, so we'll just do a resounding here. And this is support for the, the, the uh, baptized. People of God, do you promise to support Lorena and Natalie and pray for them in their new life in Christ, respond, we do. We do. And let's confess our faith by using the words of the Apostles' Creed. And I'm going to ask three questions. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? And do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of bodies, and the life everlasting. Who is the sponsors? Okay, well, you can answer for Velma there, and you talk to her about this. Do you promise to nurture these children, Lorena and Natalie, in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit and to help them live in the confidence of their baptism and communion with the church? If so, say, I do. And all the people of God, this whole congregation, all the loved ones, everybody, people of God, do you promise to support little Natalie and Lorenzo? And Lorena, I'm sorry, Lorena. And pray for them in their new life in Christ. We do. We do. Okay. So, let's get right to it here. What do we got here? What do you think this is? What is that? That's a bowl, yeah, and some water. Okay. What is it, sir? 
is water. H2O, we call it in science. Water. Get a little on you, too, there. <laughs> this stuff is precious. About two-thirds of this big old ball that we live on called Earth is covered with water. We can't drink all the water because a lot of it's salt water, but we know how to get to it and pump it out of the Earth, and we can drink fresh water. This is precious, and it's literally life. You know, I was a, a Boy Scout in the United States Marine. They told me that you can go for about four weeks without food. You're only going to go about four minutes without air. But you can go about four days without water. This is literally life. If you don't drink your water like your mommy tells you to, you're going to get dehydrated. And that's not going to be good, is it? So you've got to have this. You've got to have water. God makes it for us and puts it on earth. And I think what God uses water for in baptism is to promise us that even though, and you're going to die someday, I'm sorry to tell you that, but you're going to die someday like all the rest of us. But you know what? Even though you die because of this promise of God, you're going to live. God is going to keep you alive forever. And then there's another thing that we can do with this. Do you ever get your hands all dirty? Are you playing with worms or bugs or something like that? You, you do that? Or maybe paint? Or How do you get your hands dirty? What do you do? You paint. Okay. So you put your hands in uh, some soap, and you wash your hands with the soap, and then what happens? You get, nah, you get a gooey mess until you rinse off with water. Until you rinse off with water, like taking a bath or a shower. But here's the deal. If you just use the soap, you just got a gooey mess, don't you? If you use the water, you get rinsed off and clean. All right. Now, Natalie and Lorena, you're, you're just beautiful children. Uh, you're, you're good. But, but here's the deal. You're, you're not perfect, are you? Uh-uh. Does mommy ever get upset with you? <laughs> mommy will always love you. May not love your behavior and your words, but will always love you. And so how do you feel like when you take a shower and you get all clean, you feel refreshed and good, right? Yeah. That's what baptism does. It promises us that God's love is always there for us, cleans us, and refreshes us, and doesn't give up on us. No, no, no. Keeps us in his grace forever and his love. Okay. Who is first? Okay. <laughs> Lorena. Hmm? And your middle name is Renee, and your last name is Garcia. You are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son. We're going to do the seashell and the Holy Spirit. Precious child of God, you are sealed with the cross of Christ and you're marked with his love forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Okay. And now little Natalie Rose Lucero. Natalie Rose Lucero. There you go. Precious child of God, you are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Precious little child of God, you are sealed with the cross of Christ and you're marked with his love forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And how long is that? <laughs> ever and ever and ever. Amen. Okay, so let's do some, uh, you got a little cloth there? Some prayers. What do we want for these children? Give me some words for them. What words do we have? Best version of themselves. What else? Uh, good health. Good wisdom. Strength. Is that what you said? Okay. Love. Caring. Yeah. I think they're really, really smart, too. Just looking at them, they're alert and awake. Okay, let's pray for the children. Almighty God, we thank you for Lorena and Natalie. We thank you for their love in the world, for their wisdom, for their strength, 
for their goodness, for their days ahead. And Lord, uh, it's kind of a changing world here as we speak. And we don't quite know where things are going, but we know that they're going to be the ones to saddle up and take over. So give them the guidance that they need from their families and loved ones, from our church, that they may grow in faith toward you, in love for all people, and for the world that you have put them in. Thank you for the privilege and honor to be included in these moments where we celebrate this precious moment of baptism for these two bright and shining young ladies. And all God's people in the name of Jesus say, Amen. Amen. Okay, now we got some gifts here. Where is Jim Hoydall? He's uh, our council president, and he's got a gift. Now you watch this there, kids. He's going to take a light. There you go. And then he's going to say, let your light so shine before others. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Lorinda Renee and Natalie Rose, we welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. Amen. And then, uh, Marge, you got a special gift for the kids? Yes, we have quilts for each one of the children. Aha, uh -huh, look at that. Uh, your name is in here, and it says the day that you were baptized, and that God loves you. A special handmade quilt for each one of the children with their name. Okay, anything else? Well, young ladies, you go in peace and you serve the Lord and you be the best that you can possibly be, okay? Because you are loved by God, you are created by God in God's very image. And you go forth, and I don't know where you're going, it's gonna be quite a ride, but uh, you go and you hold on to God tight, okay? Because he's holding on to you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. I think we're going to be doing one more here pretty quick, right? We're... Okay. All righty. Prayers of intercession. On this day of resurrection joy, let us offer our prayers for ourselves, our neighbors, and our world. <clears throat> Renewing God, the good news of your resurrection changed the world. Give church leaders and all the baptized the same excitement as the women at the tomb and inspire us to share your abundant life. Merciful God, sustaining God, our creation abounds with signs of new life in budding trees and newborn creatures. Provide fertile soil, ample sunlight, and nourishing rain for the growth of plants, and provide farmers with a plentiful harvest. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Sheltering God, strengthen and sustain all who support vulnerable people across the world. Empower government agencies and international organizations that provide for refugees and migrants forced to leave their homelands. Merciful God, receive our prayer. 
encouraging God. You do a new thing among us. We pray for those gripped by fear and anxiety or who suffer in any way. Send us as your healing presence to places of hunger, pain, illness, or overwhelming sorrow. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Surprising God, you offer endless ways for us to delight in your grace. Give this community of faith a sense of joy and wonder in exploring new avenues of faith formation, worship, and discipleship. We give you thanks today for Lorena and Natalie as they join us as sisters in Christ. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Resurrecting God, you make us alive in Christ. Thank you for blessing us <clears throat> with faithful witnesses who now rest in you. Merciful God, we offer to you these petitions and those we carry in our hearts, trusting in your abundant and ever-present mercy. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. And let us share God's peace with each other. Peace.
with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Almighty God, it is indeed right and salutary that it, we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you. Thank you for Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the early witnesses of the resurrection and for the faith that they bestowed upon us in the message of scripture. Thank you that we can unite with the brothers and sisters who have died in faith and have gone on to be that great cloud of witnesses in your eternity surrounding us. And so with angels and archangels, with all the hosts of heaven, with cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. According to the scriptures, in the night which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to disciples just like us, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this, said Jesus, in remembrance of me. And when he had supped and given thanks, he took the cup and he gave it to his disciples, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, said Jesus, in remembrance of me. Let us pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory All are welcome. This is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is prepared for you, for me, for all of us. And so Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, gives everyone a place at the welcome table. Alleluia, come to the feast. In the communion blessing, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gifts of his body and blood remain with us as we seek to take the message of God's love and grace and resurrection into the world. Amen. Let us pray together. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup 
we have tasted the new heaven and earth, where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection, that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so may God, the author of life, Christ the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless us now and forever. Amen. Christ is risen. Alleluia. And our victorious head